welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Welcome to today's episode of New Cyber Frontier. Today we have a great show talking about Internet of Things and security in this newly evolving area. And we have some experts in that area on from Armis Incorporated. We have Michael Parker, who's the Chief Marketing Officer of Armis, which is a, he lists us as a startup, but they've been around for quite a few years, three years now. We'll let him talk about that a little bit, but welcome today, Michael. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Definitely. And this is one of my peak interest areas. So I'm always glad to have these shows and guests like yourself that really have an expertise and even a solution. I like to hear somebody that has an idea and isn't just tell us, you know, what's wrong, who to blame and what to be scared of. We want to hear what the future looks like, even though I think we're going to hear some of that too, right? You, uh, we'll hear a little bit. There are some things to be scared of, but there's also a lot of promise out there when you talk about sort of the IoT and enterprise and things. That's what I love to hear. So, but welcome today. Uh, thanks for joining. And give us, tell us about yourself and how you got to where you're at. Ah, well, uh, first off, you say fell, fell in love with tech uh, at, at a certain age, as we all do. Um, I've been a product manager, product marketing manager. Um, I've actually started and uh, my own company sold it. And uh, after I finished that, I uh, was introduced to Armas uh, by one of the uh, board members and really, you know, fell in love with what they were doing because of the fact that it, you know, you looked that they were addressing all these new connected devices. We call them Internet of Things for businesses. We call them the Enterprise of Things. And it just seemed to be such a huge issue. Um, and someone who enjoys doing startups, I'm a builder by nature. I like to go solve problems. Met our two co-founders, Yevgeny Diprov and uh, Nadir Israel, the CEO and CTO, respectively. Then uh, they had built an incredible team to go solve what was sadly and yet exciting, uh, a whole new problem dealing with all these new smart connected devices. And that's sort of how I got there. Um, it was an interesting problem statement when, when you look at the fact that uh, we're we're going through a huge digital transformation right now, Chris, right? It's, we're being surrounded by all these new connected devices. We see them in the homes, but the fact is there are almost 10 times as many even in the workplace. Uh, this kind of, uh, you know, transformation is bigger than PC and mobile together. You can see all the reports uh, from all the analysts and everybody else that, you know, today there's going to be, I think, uh, next year there'll be 20 billion uh, of these devices around. There'll be 25 billion devices. And, and this is the kicker. For any of us who've been around and we've seen the, you know, the explosion, I remember working on my first Mac, right? The first Apple, you know, when you're keying stuff in. I remember seeing when, you know, Windows came out and the whole change in user interfaces, the explosion of PC, the Internet, the mobile. Once again, we've created a brand new class of devices and we've been thinking connectivity first and security second. We have taken these devices and we literally haven't built security in. And that's the real problem statement. So there's a huge value here that you can walk in to even today. We're using uh, you know, a, a video conferencing solution as we're talking right now and we're recording. You can say, hey, Alexa, hey, Google, right? Hey, Siri, connect me to Chris. We can start using Facebook portal. We can use WebEx or Zoom. And we don't stop to think that each of these little devices, whether they're in our pockets, they're on our desktops, they're on a wall, most of them have zero security today. They literally have no security. It hasn't been, been put together. And we haven't recognized these new devices as what is the new insecure endpoint because they're running some sort of OS, some sort of network stack, some sort of application. So they are both smart enough to be hacked, but not smart enough to actually take the security agent, something like that. So it's a very interesting world. That's how I got here. I saw it. I saw the tech. I talked to the customers. I talked to the what are chief information security officers who they were talking to. They were excited about it, and I wanted to go do something new. Um, and that's why it's very exciting to be a part of ours. Yeah, definitely. This is an exciting area. I work in very similar area. This 
basically addressing some of the same problems. So we'll talk about that as we go on. But first, we're going to hear from our sponsors. We'll be right back after these messages. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. All right, welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. We're here talking to the Chief Marketing Officer of Armis Incorporated, Michael Parker. And Michael, it is we talk to so many technical people. We talk to business people. I would have to say you're probably the first chief marketing officer I've spoken to. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, because I speak a lot of the same lingo. I have a lot of the same excitement towards this industry that we're in. Um, but the technical people usually look at it one way, the business people another. And I think I, I get along with your approach and your, your energy level in how you, you, you talk about the industry and what's going on, very much so. So, um, but tell us the... You know, we started right before the break, the nature of this problem. You know, how right. big is it? What does it span? You know, why does it matter? Right. And the and it's interesting because, yes, I carry the, the chief marketing officer. I've been a product manager. So what excites me is tech, right? Um, so, and, and that's why I'm here at Armas is because I looked at how they were approaching it. So the problem, like, what is the issue is, and, and I talk to a lot of people both in the industry and not, but. You know, we're going to have 25 billion of these new connected devices around us. What's the challenge is really this. One, they're designed to connect. Out of the box is the number one thing. That, and because we're moving to a uh, not an Ethernet world, right, not a wired world, everything's wireless. Because it's wireless, it's not just Wi-Fi. But we're talking Bluetooth, BLE, Zigbee, and new protocols. So you have a situation where we've created a, literally a class of devices, billions of them. They're designed to connect out of the box is one issue. Second issue is there's literally no security on them because it wasn't considered. It just it just wasn't. Look at your smart TV that you put into the uh, corporate boardroom. There's no security on. It. Look at the CAT scan that's being used in the hospital. That is in in fact a medical IoT device, um, and that has no security that's put on it. The robots that are on assembly lines, whether they're doing food manufacturing or they're creating cars, those do not have security on them. Interestingly enough, a lot of those robots on assembly lines have a wireless connection, and sometimes organizations don't know the manufacturer has a right to wirelessly go in and check on them. So how, how do you know when the creator of your device on your assembly line is coming in for a legal support reason or that it's being hacked or somehow that backdoor is being leveraged? So you look at, you know, designed automatically to connect, no security. It's really hard to upgrade a lot of these devices. There was a recent article that just came out that said we need to destroy all the old IoT devices because they were built so poorly. And with that, you now have all these devices that you can't see, you can't manage, and have no security. And that's a huge security blind spot for all organizations. Um, and as the uh, Curtis Simpson, who's the CISO at Cisco Foods, he's one of our customers, um, he was talking to him the other day, and he, he had a great quote. He said, I actually struggle to find a device that's not connected. He talked about their uh, Cisco Foods acquires new companies. So they'll go in and they're very acquisitive and they'll, they use our solution because they need to see every device that's there. I mean, who ever heard of an internet connected forklift, but they actually exist. There are supermarkets today that do automated inventory with robots going up and down the aisles. Those are internet connected. All of these devices are around us. So that's that's really the issue. And what excites me about this, both from the tech and the problem statement, is uh, I love these devices. I use them all the time. But we need to make sure they're secure, and particularly when they're creating products or when they're addressing personal safety, worker safety, or even, in the medical case, case patient safety. That is a big scope. Is there – I mean, they're already out there. They're already connected. Mm -hmm. Um 
What have we already got ourselves into if this is the case? Where are we at with that? Well, we've got it. Um, we have to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, we've done it again, right? We did it with, you know, we created the PCs. They were wonderful, but they didn't have security. The Internet, even the founders of the Internet say would, they would design it differently had they known what they know now. Um, I, I have a discussion I've had with a number of industry folks is, is uh, we believe that IoT right now is already at a position where it, it's exposed. And there's a lot of discussion around regulation. Look, we and California just passed a law about regulation, right? And their regulation was to require at least that you have to be able to not use the same passport on all these devices, right? Because that happened. Um, so the manufacturers create them. You have to, one, let the people change it, and two, don't use the same default password everywhere. I know that seems like a radical concept, but that's these are base-level things we're not doing. So the question is, what can we do? I think we're beyond uh, – we're not going to have a simple fix anytime in the next couple of years because with that requires changes on the parts of manufacturers, and the manufacturers in some cases are not incented to do this. The big players, Amazon, Google, Apple – Samsung, those are ones that are thinking about how do we do the updates and how do we manage security. Again, there was another recent article that all the smaller players, they don't necessarily respond to issues. We've done security disclosures. We found issues with IoT devices. We've done it with Apple, with Amazon, with, uh, with Google. And um, all those players are actually very good players, right? When you notify them under a secure manner, we tell them what we found. We work together. We do a secure disclosure and patches are put out. But even look at the Amazon Echo, which we found with our Blueborn exploit, which is a Bluetooth exploit. Uh, Armas was the first company to wirelessly hack and take over the Amazon Echo. And we did it to show that through a protocol such as Bluetooth, which is not tracked by any other solution, right? So you can't put endpoint protection on the Amazon Echo. You're not going to see it with network access control. You're not going to be able to do any of your firewalls to stop this. It's peer-to-peer, device-to-device communication. We could hack it. We notified Amazon they're great. Amazon fixed the issue. Amazon actually forces with security updates a reboot of the Amazon Echo. So you don't have to, you know, it's not like, oh, I forgot to update my PC or my Mac. Amazon forces updates for security, so it'll shut the device off and restart it, which is good. But even Amazon was running a 12-year-old version of Linux that was exposed. Mm -hmm. And when you have the best-in-class players also having exploits, you can imagine all these smart devices that are around, all these small devices. You have sensors on wireless gas, you know, on on wireless uh, sensors on gas pipelines, and you also have all these issues throughout corporations. So our perspective is there's there's no fix coming right now. Regulation takes time. Manufacturers are not incented. And that's why there has to be a new class of security. In fact, there has to be a whole new approach. Because when you look at these devices, Chris, like we're used to, like, we'll put an agent on it or, or just, just, you know, put it behind the firewall. Those won't work. And none of these devices will take an agent. None of them. So that, that's out the door. So that's, that's not going to happen. And we're an agentless solution, which is why so many customers are talking to us right now. Agentless solution. Can you talk, mm-hmm. elaborate on that? What does this, what is your plan? What is your thought that solves this problem, or at least is a step in the right direction look like? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good question because if we're used to stick an agent on it, which is usually what you do, and there's there's numerous um, you know companies that, you know, there that, that what, do a great job of this. Can you explain yeah, what, what that agent means? Is? Yeah, what agent means to you. Well, today, right now, if you have what we call a managed device, like your laptop, your desktop, your data center, and your servers, you're going to put some agents on there that can sit on the device, track the device. They may be used as uh, sort of, you know, security protection, malware that you can use. So are you talking about some sort of malware that agent that's there? Or we're just managing it so we can see the device, changes to the operating system, make sure the changes are there so that it's completely um, updated. You can look at anyone from the Symantec's, the Mac, the, the Tanium's of the world. This is now our classic approach. Let's put an agent on the device, and then that way we track the device, and now we have insight into that device and we can classify that device and see what's going on. With this $25 billion going to $75 billion class of enterprise of things or Internet of things, you can't put any agent on them. So right off the bat, that's a non-starter. So we've devised a method that doesn't require an agent, but we can tie into corporate networks so we can get almost as much data off of doing passive, uh, continuous traffic analysis and threat detection and mitigation. And those are kind of, I don't, want, I don't want to go into the buzzwords, right? But 
we have a whole agentless approach. So you don't have to stick a piece of the software on there. There's nothing to deploy. That's that's sort of our our differentiator, but gives you an incredible amount of the, of information that you've never been able to get before. And the differentiation is on these devices. We talked before that they are smart. They have you know again operating system, network stack, and an application, however small, that we can see what a device is doing. Um, as I like to say, an iPad is not an iPad is not an iPad. In today's world. A laptop can do a thousand or a million things. It's a very powerful device, right? We always talk about how our phones are smarter than what went to an Apollo 11 moon. But you have all these devices around uh, the corporations and around businesses, and they only can do a certain number of things, right? They can't do as much as a laptop can. So we're able to track what a device is doing. And we know if a device like an iPad is being used in a lobby to check you in, is the iPad being used to run Zoom or WebEx in the uh, in the corporate boardroom? Or is an iPad being used by a physician in the emergency room? Because each of these devices, while they can be the exact same device, has different software that's run on it, is behaving differently and interacting in its environment and what it's talking to. And we can see the amount of data and sort of information coming off of that device. Not that we're peering in and decrypting. We don't do NSA kind of stuff, right? But that we're able to see all of this. And we know that Yes, a, a smart TV in the corporate boardroom will actually ping the devices in the room because it's looking for connections in case you want to do airplay or some sort of broadcast streaming. And if it's doing this at regular intervals, which we understand, we know that. And we've tracked that version of a 16 Samsung smart TV across thousands of customers because we pull it back to our cloud so we can see what they all do. Hey, so we Michael, don't just me, see yours. All right, hold on a minute. We're going to break here, hear from our sponsors. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. All right, welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. Uh, we were talking to Michael Parker before the break uh, about uh, the approach to monitoring, doing a passive approach to IoT devices on a network. So um, give us, you know, kind of go back into where you were at, where you left off with that, uh, and uh, how you see that that is the, the solution of the future. That's what's needed, uh, because we do hear people talk about endpoint solutions, AI, different things. Um, tell us about, you know, where your thoughts are to, to the needs for a solution in that space. So to your point, when you talk about the needs of the marketplace, is all of these new devices don't have a way to take an agent right now. So anybody who's saying we need to put an agent on either the Amazon Echo or the MRI or the robot on the assembly line is a non-starter. So Armas knew that when we formed the company, and part of our vision was to do this in an agentless manner. What does that mean? You know, not to go too deep with technically or marketing is like we have a manner by which we're able to leverage an organization's infrastructure, all of its networks, and read data and network traffic in a way that lets us see all the devices, whether they're on or off the network, without an agent. Um, it's quite extraordinary, and our customers love that. Uh, the thing that you look at, though, is in this new world that can't have an agent, that takes all of the old solutions off the table. So endpoint security doesn't work. Even network access control doesn't work because network access control is based on a trusted model. And as we've seen in reality, a knack is about who is this? Is this Michael's computer? I know Michael. I trust Michael, so I put him on. I don't know Chris, so Chris goes over to the guest network. But those are devices that may have agents, may be recognized, and may be trusted or not trusted, but they don't know when a device is acting poorly. So in addition to agentless, the real pivot we're seeing in the marketplace and the need from customers, and I want to stick an agent because I've got agent fatigue and I'm tired, but could you tell me if the device is behaving poorly? That's the real difference. How do you know if a smart TV is infected before, say, WannaCry pops up and you see the, uh, the ransomware on there? And there are behavior and telltale signs that we see without an agent, 
And these signs are the same when devices start to act uh, improperly. So you can't put an agent on these devices. It's a non-starter. The pivot needs to be what is the device doing? And that's sort of the new way we see even all the other players are moving to right now. They're actually following after us. And it has to be a whole fresh approach to these billions of devices that just aren't being tracked by traditional security. Interesting. So you said um, all the other players. I'm, I'm curious, who do you see and what areas are those other players and what industries are, are they addressing? Are Because this is such a big market that you pretty much can't do it all. Um, you, you run. You're absolutely right. It's, it's been interesting for me, right, because I'm almost three years in watching this when I, when I saw this problem. That's why I was excited about it. Um, you know, two years ago, I will tell you, uh, the, the, the enterprise was like, we don't have, they would tell you, we don't have any IoT on, on our, uh, on our, in our company, and nothing gets on the network that we don't allow. We go in and we find out most of them would, um, it was a shocking number. Most companies don't see 40% of the devices that are around their network. Um, and I'll even get case in point. We were talking with a very large billion dollar company the other day, and he stopped us in the middle of showing them what was on his network. And he said, that's an Apple watch. I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, that is exactly what I was concerned about, which we, which is the Apple watch is paired to the iPhone. The iPhone is on the corporate network and allowed to be there. The Apple watch is now effectively on the corporate network. That could also be an Android watch or any other type of smart watch. And so if that watch in that, that smart device in any capacity has been violated or is vulnerable and can get onto the phone and think it's onto the corporate network. There's a daisy chain effect that, that creates issues here. So they're only now, I call right now, we're seeing a great awakening by the security professionals of we are surrounded by these devices. To your point, we're also seeing new entrants into the marketplace where there are some specialty. There's you're seeing some healthcare medical device companies. You're seeing OT device companies, right? Um, and the industrial side, the interesting thing is all of our customers right now, they are less worried about Stuxnet and they're more concerned with WannaCry or not Petya. Because Stuxnet, you know, all of that is it, that's really high tech and high caliber. They're they're getting hit with WannaCry right now through these unmanaged devices, and, and it is taking them down. It's causing real pain today, and that's sort of the difference. So there are going to be new players in the space. They're going to be very specialized. Our goal is to, to be able to address all of those scenarios in, in our approach. You know, I, I heard basically what I heard, and tell me if this is true, that they're more worried about bricking that device that somebody, a customer bought and would be a bad reputation for them if the device didn't work anymore. Uh, that's that's what you're seeing is you know more more concerned about reputation and product chains than actually the data that's transferred. No, so um, they are the organizations are always concerned about uh, a hack. No one wants to be on the front page of the news. They are what they're really concerned about when you're talking about in industrial um, and even in medical. If a device goes down, that is a production line in this issue, right? So they're yes, they're always concerned that they don't want to they don't want to have to be in a position where they've been fully hacked. They're making disclosures um, and such. But the issues with IoT devices and enterprise IoT devices are really the following: one, can I have uptime? That's the first thing. Because this is less about data exfiltration. While that does happen through these devices, we're talking about device and data manipulation. The fear is not about you know the the question is what data are they going to get off my robot on the assembly line, right? That's not the issue. When they take down your assembly line, that is a material impact to an organization, and whether that happens to be a car company or a food service company. And worse, imagine if you are a manufacturer and they don't take those robots down, but they just change them 10%, so the entire batch of product is ruined. As I like to say, people may say that IoT is just refrigerators and you know, Fitbits and refrigerators. That refrigerator starts to matter when it's housing the flu vaccine for 2019, someone has hacked in and kept the thermostat showing where it should be, but they've actually raised the internal temperature and destroyed a major batch of flu vaccine. The reality of that is old people will die, young people will die, because those are facts for whom, whom packs flu, and a company's stock is going to go down. So the concerns that our customers have, yes, they always want to stay off the front page. They're saying, if my production line goes down, I lose money and it impacts my bottom line. 
if my CT scanner goes down, I actually take a major piece of medical equipment, so I can't do my job, I can't diagnose people. The real uh, deep-seated fear on the medical side is if people start manipulating data, right? So what happens if the X-ray scanner is saying it's a normal X-ray, but it's actually bombarding the patient with more radiation than it should? We've seen a blood infusion uh, pump that has been infected with malware. We have seen uh, CT scanners go down with ransomware. So it's less the concerns than the customers we talk to are less brand damage and more about operational, patient safety, personal safety people on the line here. And then is this device not being used as a target itself, but is this the doorway onto my network to go deeper? Because mm -hmm. that's the real fear is really, and the story everybody talks about, it's a two or three year old story, is data exfiltration through a aquarium thermostat at a casino. You all can Google it. It was all over RSA again last year. It was kind of because it's been around for a couple of years. But literally, we've seen data exfiltration through vending machines. And, and they don't see that the dwell time on this is very high. They don't see these things until 10 gigabytes of data has been taken out. And they're going, are you kidding me? My vending machine was my point of entry. Who would have thought? Mm -hmm. So... Does that help answer? Yeah, your your customers are pretty. You you service a certain industries. I heard um, industrial IoT and medical. Is that kind of your primary bread and butter there? Uh, act, uh, actually, we're very cross vertical. So we're seeing definitely doing industrial, absolutely doing healthcare. Um, retail is is also exploding. Um, from every retail, we do see from the warehouse to the store shelf to the uh, checkout is really across that entire life cycle is we see that are there. And we have a number of financial companies I mentioned Bain Capital is in mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we're working with them. And also there's a number of, uh, of high tech companies that are coming in uh, that are using us right now. Um, again, we'll be in a position probably in the next uh, couple of months to be naming some of these customers, but we're, we're closing large high tech organizations who just with, because they have digital workplaces, they have these devices everywhere. And um, again, what's a tangible, who would have thought a badge reader was a point of entry to your network? But it can be, and we've seen it. Interesting. So what do you think about um, when we talk about what the path looks like in the future? I mean, obviously, it's, you're still rather new. What's the technology path? Does AI fit into that? Does blockchain fit into that? Where do you see the direction? We so uh, we laugh because because AI is used and being the chief marketing officer, I should have it all over my website, and I don't um, because we we've used the term machine learning, and um, we do believe in AI. This has to be done. So one is there have to be an AI or machine learning uh, component? Absolutely. Even for us, we uh, we're a cloud solution, so we anonymize all of our data, and we have uh, probably the largest device knowledge base. That's why we know the difference between an iPad uh, being used in a lobby or in a boardroom or by a doctor who's uh, in an emergency room. We understand the difference of all of those, including webcams, access points, routers, and such. So where is AI going? It's a necessary component because of the scalability of the solutions to see recognizable patterns in, in devices. In terms of blockchain, um, anything to move it forward, look, we're, we're all part of this together, but most of the experts I've talked to recently have been saying blockchain is great from a connectivity perspective, but even these devices, the challenge there still is, what if the device itself is somehow built and secure? Um, we recently just did um, a security disclosure, or we called it bleeding bit, and it was a chip level disclosure with uh, uh, BLE chips from Texas Instruments. And we focused primarily on access points, and we found millions of access points that could be taken over completely uh, through the BLE chip to the main chip, and it was totally out of the kill chain, so you'd never be able to see it, and it could destroy network segmentation. And that was, uh, you know, a, a pretty pretty wide wake-up call for that. We work with Cisco, Aruba, and Meraki, and they patched it. We will be announcing at RSA this year more devices that are impacted because we've been talking with others. Of course, we do it quietly until such a time as they're patched. The challenge, what do I see moving forward? We are going to continue to see exposures. We must remain and be diligent, both in terms of the uh, people who are buying these devices, either on a corporate or a personal level. And we must require more on part of the manufacturers. I think that when you have software being written by one party, hardware being written by another party, and some level of firmware may still also come in on a third party. There's a lot that you have to look at to say, how do we make sure that, uh, that we make sure the entire 
communication and connection chain of all these new devices is properly secured. That's going to be a significant challenge uh, moving forward for all of us. Okay. So kind of in, in closing out here, um, anybody you'd like to reach out to, any information about how to contact you, who would be a benefit to contact you? Uh, go ahead and put that out. Oh, well, I appreciate that is, you know, and anybody who is, uh, whether you, any security practitioner, whether you're uh, you're actually sitting there in the sock, uh, if you're sitting in front of the SIM looking at logs, they should be reaching out. Most of the time we're talking to VPs of security infrastructure, uh, chief security officers, uh, CISOs, chief information security officers, and CIOs. These are the ones that are, are contacting us and saying, I don't think I can see everything in my environment. Can you help? And we come in and we show them what's in their environment, and those are usually um, pretty eye-opening uh, reports that we give them of all the devices um, that are out there. So those are the folks that reach out. Um, we're happy to talk to all of them and, and would love the opportunity to show what we can do. But this is uh, definitely, we use the phrase brave new world a lot. Uh, this is a very interesting, insecure new world with these, uh, with these new insecure endpoints. And how would they get in contact with you? What's your website? Perfect. They can just uh, they can send uh, just send an email to uh, info at armist.com or security at armist.com. We've got people on all of those right now, um, and we're tracking those. Um, and we also, you know, our uh, our phone number uh, it, it's on our website. I won't put it on here, but info at armist a r m s a r m i s dot com, and we get right back to them. All right. We don't usually give out phone numbers on the air anyway, so that's perfect. Um, but Good. thanks for joining today. Good for me. Well, definitely. I think hopefully we can get some people reaching out to you because we need to start looking at this problem. Uh, thanks again for being on today's episode of New Cyber Frontier. Thanks. So much. The views or opinions expressed during this podcast are not those of Colorado Technical University. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at newcyberfrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.